Oh, hello there. Here we go. Um, my name is Mike Lenz, Associate Professor of Ur Urban Planning and Public Policy at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. I uh, want to begin by thanking Dr. Hancock Alfaro for inviting me to discuss um, some of my research, some but more broadly research by a bunch of other people um, that really gets into, I think, some of what we need to do about Los Angeles' uh, housing affordability crisis and really crises, uh, particularly from the perspective of uh, Black Angelinos. So let me start by sharing my screen um, because what's a professor without his PowerPoint? Um, so housing in Black Los Angeles, that's, that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and I also wanna just broadly thank uh, the No Going Back Black Experience Action Team um, for you know, doing the work right now to uh, really uh, study and understand and do something about um, these associated problems with housing affordability in our, in our region. Um, so I'm gonna start by just giving kind of the, 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 the whole point here of why I'm talking, um, which is certainly not going to be a surprise to any of y'all, which is that California and Los Angeles in particular have these huge housing affordability problems um, that disproportionately affect Black Angelinos. And um, what does this look like uh, in terms of, of numbers? Because I'm, I'm a numbers person. So I think, you know, this is a busy graph, but what we're looking at is three points in time, 2000, 2010, and 2017. At all of these points in time, LA County is more expensive than California, is more expensive than uh, the United States. When we look at a particular indicator, which is severe rent burdens, that means people spending more than 50% of their income on rent. If you are in the position where you're spending more than 50% of your income on rent, you don't have a lot left over for other things. Um, for spending on other necessary things, right? And so this is a, a you know an indicator of of kind of this confluence between poverty and high housing costs. Um, and so again, like at each of these points in time, LA is more expensive than California is more expensive than the country. But we see something important going on over this relatively short period, seventeen years, where Los Angeles is pulling away from California, is pulling away from the United States. And all three of these geogra geographies and it, it are more expensive in 2017 and certainly now than they were in 2000. Now let's hone in on a place where we know that um, a lot of black people are concentrated in Los Angeles. So this looks at three uh, areas within the Los Angeles uh, uh, the city of Los Angeles um, in blue, um, the west side, you know, over here in UCLA land. Um, in the orange is the east side um, and central Los Angeles. And then in the red is south, central, and Watts, where again, we know where uh, a lot of uh, Black Angelinos are concentrated. And you see that the, the share of, of people in those neighborhoods that spend more than 50% of their income on rent you know, way outpaces um, the kind of more, uh, the, the, the more expensive, but much higher earning areas on the West side, and even um, a, a similarly low income area uh, on the East side, also including, you know, the central part of, of Los Angeles, um, where, you know, for some reason or another, Black Angelinos, or at least the neighborhoods containing lots of Black Angelinos, have incredibly high housing cost burdens. So these affordability problems, again, no, no mystery to, to many of you, I'm sure. These housing affordability problems exacerbate, um, you know, these kind of four big uh, housing problems that, that flow, of course, from, um, uh, from high housing costs. You know, one is homelessness, uh, another is segregation, uh, another is gentrification and displacement, which is much worse in LA than in most places. And then of course we have uh, COVID, which is obviously uh, making this a lot worse and going to continue to make this much worse. Um, something that I'm sure you, you all know is that 
um, homelessness is, uh, is, 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 a, is a problem that has, has always been worse in California and in Los Angeles than most parts of the country. Um, and, but we are pulling away as a state from the rest of the country in terms of the extent to which homelessness um, seems to be a, a, a massive, it seems to be a, a, a prevalent problem here in, in the region and, the, and in the state. I say seems to be because data on, on homelessness and people experiencing homelessness is notoriously bad. Um, it's very difficult to exactly know exactly how many people are homeless uh, on a given night or for a given year or for any stretch of time. But it seems pretty obvious that, that this is a bigger problem in California and in Los Angeles than, than the rest of the country. And the gap between us and everybody else is getting wider. You know, homelessness is going up around here it's not going up um, nearly as fast or often not at all around the country. And certainly a fact that you all know is that black people make up 9% of the LA County population yet 40% of its homeless population. Those numbers surely have, have some you know, error to them in terms of the specificity, particularly on the homeless side, but we know that black, Amer black Angelinos are far uh, 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 more likely to be homeless than any other racial or ethnic group in our region. Um, gentrification and displacement are certainly, um, you know, very, you know, hot topics and, and big, more importantly, big problems in, in several neighborhoods uh, across the country as, you know, housing gets more expensive and demand for central city living, um, in, in, you know, seems to have, have seems to have increased in, in recent years and decades. Um, this is a much more acute problem in Los Angeles. And I particularly, of course, want to pay attention to um, how this relates to an exodus of, of Black Angelinos in, in, the, in, in our region. So in 1960, LA County uh, contained 93% of our metropolitan area's Black population. So that includes um, San Bernardino and Riverside counties and Los Angeles County. Um, as well as Orange County, LA County had 93% of, of the area's uh, black population. In 1990, that was 81%. By 2019, that's 64%. So 36% of the region's black population now lives outside of LA County. Um, you know, this, this is simple math. LA County lost 120,000 black residents from 1980 to 2014 as the overall population of LA County grew. Um, and so, you know, where did those people go? A lot of them went to San Bernardino and Riverside counties, um, you know, where the kind of share of the region's uh, black population doubled um, just over the last 30 years. Um, you know, then a little bit more specifically to the, the issues of gentrification and, and displacement, if you look at most metropolitan areas and um, low income areas within, low income or racially diverse areas within uh, met, uh, most metros in the US, the bigger problem is a continuation of concentration of poverty. So most neighborhoods are not gentrifying. Um, most gentrifiable neighborhoods are not gentrifying. Most neighborhoods are, are across the country that have high concentrations of low-income uh, households are becoming themselves more concentrated with more and more low-income households, where that is the chief kind of problem in that neighborhood. Um, that is not the case in Los Angeles. Um, it's the only region in the country where more residents live in areas that uh, are experiencing low income displacement um, that are experiencing low income concentration. So of course we still have neighborhoods in which gentrification is not the problem or displacement is not really happening and that there is this kind of increased concentration of low income households. Um, but we have more people living in areas of, uh, where displacement is, is, is occurring than areas where low income concentration is occurring. And that is unique. Um, across across the country. Segregation. Segregation has been, of course, a, a feature of American cities as long as we've had uh, American cities. And, and certainly um, ever since the, the uh, Black Americans left the South in large numbers uh, in the, uh, you know, from 1910 to 1970, 
um, and we're you know flowing into uh, America's northern and western cities in particular. Um, we've had segregated segregated landscapes, and um, you know there's uh, you know tons of history there that um, I can't quite get into, but that history still lives with us today. Um, you know, people, uh, uh, Black Americans, broadly speaking, not just in Lo Los Angeles, tend to inherit uh, neighborhood disadvantage in, in ways that white Americans uh, certainly do not. Um, you know, over 70% of Black Americans who live in today's poorest neighborhoods are from the same families that lived in the poorest neighborhoods of our cities in, in, in the 1970s. 66% um, of Black children um, born 1985 to 2000, so of course most of them or all of, all of them are, are pretty grown up by now, um, that they grew, they, they grew up in neighborhoods with poverty rates greater than 20%. That is almost an unheard of living situation for white Americans, right? Um, so this is this kind of confluence between race and poverty that is, that is very, very much um, a feature of American urban life. Um, and so like, here's a, a bit about how this looks in, in Los Angeles. And, you know, many of you obviously surely know kind of the racial fabric of, of uh, Los Angeles, where we have a, a kind of remaining concentration of uh, Black Los Angeles in, in green here, in, you know, south of the 10, uh, west of the 110, um, that, uh, you know, kind of marks the uh, you know, the, the, the kind of last remaining bastion of, of Black Los Angeles. And, you know, e you know uh, I guess what is important here is that Los Angeles, of course, has these very, very concentrated, um, um, racially concentrated neighborhoods that have kind of always looked like this. You know, they're, they're certainly not, you, you can't overlay um, our racial characteristics of our neighborhoods, you know, perfectly on what it looked like in 1940 or 1950. And obviously there, there's been a, a, a dramatic increase in the uh, uh, share of uh, Hispanic uh, Latino uh, households in, you know, plenty of previously predominantly African-American neighborhoods. Um, but the, these, these segregated uh, features certainly have echoes to, to the past and um, relate uh, very strongly to our, our histories of, of redlining and racial, explicit racial exclusion. So why do these patterns kind of persist to the, to the present? Um, it is certainly the fact that overt discrimination and explicit discrimination in various channels of the housing market, be it uh, mortgage, uh, uh, um, you know, mortgage lending, um, real estate agent steering, um, and and kind of avoidance of particular areas uh, is is less common than it used to be, but it certainly still plays a role. So um, there's still discrimination in our mortgage markets. There's still discrimination. On the, on the behalf of real estate agents in terms of where they're likely to show people uh, different housing options. Um, you know, and then like it, it is, I think there's clearly a mechanism in which home seekers of various races and ethnicities have uh, kind of negative perceptions of black spaces and neighborhoods and they avoid those neighborhoods. Um, and as a result, the market devalues black spaces and black neighborhoods. This has a lot of effects. Um, it, Perpetuates segregation, of course, because you know white Americans and and Americans of other racial backgrounds are less likely to want to move into uh, these spaces. Um, but then also that devaluation makes it more and more makes it more difficult for even black homeowners to uh, kind of help reduce those wealth gaps, right? Where these income and wealth disparities persist um, for a bunch of reasons. Um, but one reason that these wealth disparities persist is we have much lower home ownership rates, but also when we do own our own homes, we're much less likely to see these kind of big, gain, big gains and returns to home ownership um, that people see in other neighborhoods and, and have, we have less successful um, home ownership outcomes on, on the average. There are other reasons and you know, for the remainder of my talk, I'm going to mostly talk about um, exclusionary zoning and how we can um, at least start to chip away through 
uh, against some of these housing affordability and segregation problems, um, and I would maybe even argue gentrification problems, um, by increasing housing supply, by you know, pulling back um, these layers of exclusionary zoning. So land use regulations um, come in many forms and they come for many reasons. Um, you know, many of our, our land use regulations such as um, uh, minimum lot sizes or parking requirements or floor to area ratios um, that, you know, and, or single family zoning that all kind of work to restrict density. Um, they may have had kind of, you know, good or neutral intentions, um, but many of these unintended consequences do relate to um, increasing the, the cost of housing for, for most people. Um, of course, uh, uh, you know, there's a bunch of zoning stuff that, you know, also kind of separates industrial and residential and commercial land uses. And I'm not really, you know, talking so much about that. Um, and then of course, there are many land use regulations that have that explicitly have an exclusionary uh, intent. So racial uh, covenants would be a form of this. Um, redlining is more in the mortgage market, but certainly interacted and interplayed um, with exclusion, um, with, with racial exclusion uh, uh, in, on an explicit way. And, but the one, one way we, wanna, we might wanna think about some of the um, motivations for our, our, our low density zoning that is very uh, predominant in, in Los Angeles and in the surrounding area is that once we, once people were unable to uh, uh, maintain racially homogenous neighborhoods through explicitly racial policies like covenants, like redlining, um, like, you know, just, you know, garden variety uh, intimidation, um, land use regulations were increasingly used to segregate people by not only race, but of course by class. And when you segregate by class, you're more likely to segregate um, by race. So what do we do about all this stuff? Like, so there's roughly three things we can do about housing affordability. We can build more, um, which you know, any economist, any housing economist would tell you is gonna you know, have a long run um, positive effect on housing affordability. It's gonna, when you have more housing for people to buy, when you have more options for tenants and homeowners alike, the cost of housing on average is gonna go down. These processes are very much locally controlled, right? Um, not just by, not just at the jurisdictional level, but often at the neighborhood level. So within Los Angeles, it's harder to build in on some side, some parts of town than other parts of town. You can give people money. You can subsidize housing. Uh, there's more resources for this at the federal level. Um, there's certainly more resources for this at the state level than at the city level. Um, and it's highly unlikely that the city or county of Los Angeles is going to find enough money to subsidize their way out of this housing affordability crisis. Um, and then you can enact price controls or rent controls, other renter protections. These have often have you know, short-term and immediate effects of keeping people in place, keeping people in their neighborhoods, keeping people in their units. Um, they can help, you know, there's a lot of important things we can do to fend off unfair uh, or unjust e evictions, right? By uh, uh, assisting people with, with legal protections and uh, legal advice or counsel. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, some of these solutions are likely to um, have some trade-offs in which you can help somebody uh, you know, with some kind of rent control or rent stabilization or tenant protection, other kind of ten tenant protection, but the other people that you don't help are not only don't benefit from that policy, but then landlords and developers might um, act in, in ways that we actually don't want them to act. Um, when they're when these protections are really robust, right? If we have a, a really really strong uh, rent stabilization and rent control policy, it, it is typically the case that landlords will, at the margin, pull their units off off the market and and tur and turn them into condos or other ways to make more money. Um, at the end of the day, all of these solutions are necessary in. It, it, when you have a, a problem as large as Los Angeles has. And these solutions complement one another. They, it, you, you, they're not something that 
in my view, should should be um, should be viewed as being in conflict. So here's one of my cases that we probably need to build more housing. This looks from 1990 to 2016 in the state of California. Population and jobs steadily increases. Um, we have one period in which we're kind of keep we're, we're we're keeping pace with the growth of people and the growth of economic opportunity there in kind of the, the 2003 to 2006-ish period. And of course the Great Recession hits and, and the bottom falls out. And we, we're just still kind of climbing through, cl cl trying to climb back from, from that uh, bottoming out of the housing market. But you see, even before um, we had this kind of overheated housing production, uh, or arguably overheated housing production in the kind of early to mid 2000s, um, we were way below what, where we needed to be if you look at a year like 1996 or 1997. And of course, if we look at years like 2013 and 14, sure, we're, we're starting to kind of move back up to, um, uh, we're, we're increasing our housing production, but we're not keeping pace even close to population and, and job growth. And what we have, you know, what we have as a region is a geography in which the vast majority of our residential space is off limits for, you know, any kind of uh, multifamily production, right? So this, the, everything in yellow here are areas where you can only build a single family home. There's nothing inherently wrong with a single family home, but I do think that there's a big problem with um, with, with banning apartments from such uh, large parts of any city. And we, the, the city of, of Los Angeles has 4 million people. The county has 10 million. The region is the, the, the first or second uh, most populous region in the entire country, depending on how you measure it. Um, and it's, it's hard to really uh, make a, a strong argument that um, we have to have such, such large uh, areas of geography walled off to, to, the, uh, to something as simple as apartments. And it's important to point out that when you have such uh, a dominance of a single family landscape, it doesn't necessarily um, eliminate the, 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 the production of multifamily housing, but it often makes it um, where we have to build multifamily housing more intensely in the small corridors in which we allow it. And you know, I think this this often impacts um, uh, Black Los Angeles uh, in, in in particular ways, in which if 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 if, if the local uh, community has has not been able to fend off um, upzoning in the past or present, um, then when people are looking for spaces to develop these large structures that they, that they feel they have to develop because there's just not a lot of places to put multifamily production, um, they're gonna develop that land very, very intensely. And you see that in, in Los Angeles, we often get kind of these, these big 50 plus unit structures in, in red, or we get um, no construction, <laughs> or we get single family homes. And you know, this, this, the, the kind of that missing middle, um, even you know, 49 units is not really kind of, is not really small. Um, you end up getting not, not enough of that. And therefore you have this really intense um, and, and, and high rises that nobody likes that stuff, um, you know, in most neighborhoods. So, you know, I want to reiterate uh, that you know because of, of, of income and wealth disparities, um, banning multifamily housing often bans people of color, and and there's lots of research on this that when we um, when we have uh, you know a predominance of single family zoning or we have a predominance of very tight and restrictive zoning that doesn't allow housing production in a lot of places, we often ban. Um, uh, we, we often make it so, so difficult for, um, you know, black people to bu buy their first, um, you know, small apartment or, or medium sized apartment. We make it hard for black people to buy their, buy a duplex as kind of their foothold into the housing market. We make it hard for people that don't have a ton of income to, to rent something um, modest in, in a, in a decent neighborhood. Right. And, um, 
you know, a lot of this housing exclusion that we, we engage in keeps people not only from being able to afford housing, uh, you know, because housing is easier to afford when you don't have to buy it in large quantities, which is what a single family home um, typically is if you compare it to an apartment. But we also uh, keep people often out of the neighborhoods with the highest opportunity, which you know, tend to be predominantly single family neighborhoods um, in more suburban locations or um, you know, higher income locations. You know, if you, you know, the prototypical example of a you know, neighborhood like that within the city of Los Angeles, of course, is, is, is the west side of Los Angeles, which is a, you know, a big area that I'm pointing out. But like, you know, these are spaces where um, you don't get a lot of uh, housing production um, and you don't have a lot of opportunity for people to access those spaces. Um, and, you know, we all know that home ownership rates are much lower. So like if single family housing and home ownership are, go kind of hand in hand, um, you know, black households are less likely to be able to own those single family properties and, and um, are less likely to, to be able to live in those, those, those buildings. So what do we do? I think we need to legalize mid-sized multifamily housing in particular in more places, especially in single family home neighborhoods, especially in neighborhoods that have higher opportunity, um, doing that in, in cities and, and suburbs. Um, we need to implement a aggressive fair housing strategy. Um, housing developers do want to build in higher income and whiter neighborhoods, but in those neighborhoods, local residents are, are very strongly empowered to stop it. Um, and so if we find ways to take that power out of, uh, uh, of the hands of these local um, actors, we can have a better chance at building more housing in places like the West Side. Um, and that helps to steer developers out of uh, uh, South Central, South Los Angeles, and you know, traditional communities of color that are you know, rightfully looking around and say, why is the development coming here? I don't want more housing here. I don't want more traffic. I don't want more um, congestion in my schools. I don't want um, this potential for displacement and gentrification that I think might flow from, from this new housing production in my neighborhood. Um, so, you know, the easiest solution all the time to me um, is, is, well, the easiest policy solution um, the kind of easiest development solution is to build more housing in higher opportunity places and, and steer that development and that population um, growth into those, those spaces and give people opportunities that haven't traditionally had those opportunities to move there. This is intense. This, there's, a, there's a thousand political reasons why this hasn't occurred yet, um, you know, but that's, I think, the goal that people need to, to unify around it and push for. Um, and I you know, wanna you know, kind of reiterate that none of these solutions are sufficient on their own and, and certainly zoning reform or housing production um, is, 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 you know, is along those lines. We do also need more generous subsidies and, and renter protections. Um, again, I do think that zoning reform is complementary to these policies because subsidy dollars are gonna go further. If we think about um, a lot of the controversy and concern over uh, uh, Proposition HHH and um, you know, various kind of emergency uh, measures that we've taken or not taken to, to house uh, the, uh, people experiencing homelessness during COVID, um, so many of these things would be easier if we had more um, ability to produce housing, if we had a more flexible, um, land use regime that could, you know, allow for, um, you know, quick acquisition of land and production um, to occur, you know, and, and, you know, of course, a lot of the frustration around Proposition HHH is how long uh, so, so much of this uh, housing has taken to, to come online. And then, you know, if we, if we do uh, produce housing in, in neighbor, neighborhoods where, um, we're concerned about low-income people being displaced. Renter protections can complement, um, you know, upzoning and, and the the increase in production in those areas. But but support for tenant protections should not be a reason 
to to be opposed to more housing. You know, you can support both things. Is is kind of my point there. Um, so that's all for me. Um, I hope that you've you've enjoyed my my recording uh, coming to you live from Los Angeles. Not so live. Um, and and I, I I look forward to um, you know being available to to engage with the committee um, uh, with the, any questions and, and follow up that you may have. So thank you.